This is a picture of George Whitey Rudnick, Brooklyn hoodlum, whose body was found trussed up in the back seat of this automobile after he had been brutally stabbed 47 times. His murder was only one of the many killings attributed to the Brownsville mob, otherwise known as Murder Incorporated. This is the witness. Not a trial, not a court of law, not a legislative inquiry, but a simulated hearing before a simulated committee. Tonight's witness, Abe Rellis. Abe Rellis, Kid Twist, the scourge of Brownsville, reputed to be the leader of a band of Brooklyn hoodlums who have allegedly put murder on a business basis. Tonight, the committee will probe into the charge that Rellis and his gang are closely tied to the leaders of the National Crime Syndicate, that they are, in fact, the execution branch of a fantastic underworld kill-for-hire organization known as Murder Incorporated. This session will be getting underway very shortly, but now we return you to our studios. This portion of The Witness is brought to you by Camel, the real cigarette, an exclusive blend of costly Turkish and domestic tobaccos. The best tobacco makes the best smoke. Hello, I'm James Daly, and I think I've found the perfect Christmas gift. It needs no wrapping, no greeting card, requires no shopping around, and it'll make a hit with every smoker on your list. It's the Camel Christmas House, containing two cartons of America's most satisfying cigarette. 400 camels, 400 real cigarettes. As you can see, the Camel Christmas House comes ready to give, beautifully wrapped, even has its own built-in greeting card. Whether you choose the Camel Christmas House containing two cartons, or the single carton in its gay Christmas wrap, you give the finest taste in smoking. The best tobacco makes the best smoke. And the camel blend of costly tobaccos has never been equaled for rich taste and easygoing mildness. This Christmas, give a real cigarette. Give camels. Down in the hearing room, the committee is set to open this investigation into the criminal activities of Abe Kid Twist Rellis. This is Chairman Paul McGrath seated at the hearing table talking with Mr. Charles Hayden and Mr. William W. Smithers. You ready, Mr. And this Mr. Frank A. Milan, the members of the committee. We're ready to get underway. Here's Chairman McGrath. All right, this hearing will come to order. Now, everyone, please take your seats. I want to stress the fact that there will be no interruptions, there will be no picture taking, and there will be no interviews. In fact, I will allow nothing to interrupt this testimony. Clerk, will you call Mr. Abe Rellis? Abe Rellis? Abe Rellis. Uh, Mr. Chairman, may I identify myself? Please do. My name is J. Richard Carroll. I'm here to represent Mr. Rellis. Very well, Mr. Carroll, you may share that table with your client. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Will you administer the oath, please, sir? Your right hand. Solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth shall be God. I do. Say I do? I do, yes. Thank you. State your full name. Name is Abe Rellis. Otherwise known as Kid Twist? Congratulations. Well, that's your nickname. Uh, no, uh, please uh, be seated before you give testimony, Mr. Rellis. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize it. Uh, right here, Abe. Hmm. Uh, Mr. Chairman, with your permission, Mr. Rellis would like at this time to read from a prepared statement. Very well, the committee will hear his statement. Well, I don't need that. I know what I'm going to say. Uh, I just want to make it clear. Coming, am I supposed to use... Uh... Uh, yes, you may talk directly into the microphone. Yeah. Everyone wants to hear. Uh, I just want to make it clear in uh, coming down here before the committee that it's my uh, intention here to cooperate as much as possible. In other words, I know that the uh, committee has a job to do, and I'm here to help them. Um, because I think that I could help myself. In other words, there's a lot of confusion uh, surrounding my name, and I think if I can clear that up, I help the committee, I'll help myself. Have you finished your statement? There's only one other point that I wanted to make, and that is uh, as long as we could... Uh, keep this whole thing on a high level, I think we'll be able to have a productive session. Thank you very much for your offer to cooperate. We hope that you really mean it, Mr. Ellis. Now, sir, to get down to the question. At the present time, are you being held in custody on a charge of vagrancy? Yes, I am, but uh, that's just a technicality. The important thing there was that I gave myself up. I walked in, so they just used the vagrancy thing. And I had on my possession at that time, what I have... I had about 1,200. I had 1,200. You say you voluntarily gave yourself up to the police? That's right. In other words, I heard they were looking for me. The first thing I did, I walked right Will in. Will you tell this committee why the police were looking for you? 
That I don't know. Then perhaps I can tell you. They were looking for you, Mr. Ellis, because you are a known hoodlum. And because there's a campaign underway to get your kind off the streets of Brooklyn. What do you mean, my kind? I mean, what kind? What is that supposed to mean? Is that kind of talk necessary? You don't know that in the past ten days, Mr. Rellis, over 100 hoodlums and punks have been collared by the police and brought in for questioning? No, I didn't know that. Do you know the reason for this roundup? Well, I mean, if I didn't know there was a roundup, how am I going to know there was a reason? All right, Mr. Rellis, I've got something that I would like to show you. Bailiff, would you bring that map over and show it to Mr. Rellis so he can see it clearly, please? Thank you. Mr. Rellis, do you know what that is? Yeah, that's Shepherd's Field and the uh, surrounding neighborhood. There. You recognize Brooklyn? Yeah, Brooklyn. Now, Mr. Rellis marked on that map, if you'll notice those stars scattered all around, are locations where murders have been committed in the past several years. Unsolved murders. 200 unsolved murders, Mr. Rellis. Do you have anything to say about that? Well, the only thing I'd say is what anybody would say. That's a terrible thing. Look at the map, Mr. Ellis. Do you notice that most of those stars are clustered around a particular section of Brooklyn? You ought to recognize the neighborhood. No, I don't recognize it. There are too many stars there. Come it covers on, the streets. Mr. Ellis. What do you mean, come on? Don't talk. Get that map out of here. I can't see the man. All right, Bailiff. Yeah. You may put it away for now. What do you mean, come on? You point out a section where there are 200 murders and you ask me to identify it, and right away people start putting two and two together. That's an objection. What are you sitting Mr. there for? Object to that. I feel that it's highly prejudicial to exhibit a map allegedly showing a number of unsolved murders. Then proceed to question Mr. Rellis about it. This is highly irregular. Mr. Chairman, uh, I merely asked if he could identify the neighborhood in which most of these murders took place. I don't think there's anything prejudicial about that. Do I, Mr. Of Smith. course, if he has some good reason for not wanting to no, answer, please no, let him say no. so. No, no, no. There's no good reason. I'm going to be very happy to answer the question. It's just that you got a little cute there. I picked you up on it, and that's what I'm saying. In other words, you point out the section, and if I identify it right away, I'm an expert on 200 packages dropped in Brooklyn. Packages? Well, whatever you want to call them, what, the corpses, whatever. The important thing is this. I know nothing about those murders. That's the important thing. All right, Mr. Ellis, the neighborhood Mr. Smith has asked you to identify is Brownsville, isn't it? Well, as a matter of fact, if I looked at it closely, it probably is Brownsville, yeah. All right, sir. Now, you live in Brownsville? Yes, I was born there, was raised there, married there, lived there, worked there. And you have your business in Brownsville? Well, that's what I just said. I worked Yes, but there. you didn't tell us what kind of business. I don't think you asked me. Well, I'll ask you now. What kind of business are you in, Mr. Ellis? I'm a luncheonette proprietor. Restaurant, Joan? <laughs> I have partners in a restaurant or what a kind luncheonette, of a restaurant whatever you want to call that, Mr. Ellis? Well, what do you mean, what kind? How many kinds are there? There are many good kinds. Restaurant. For instance, some restaurants serve liquor and some don't. Your restaurant serve liquor? Oh, I didn't know what you was driving at. Yeah, we have liquor, so what's Well, what's didn't you point? find it rather hard to square your criminal record with the state liquor authority if you do own a restaurant and it does serve liquor? What record? Well, yours. Rather extensive, isn't it? I count 42 arrests. 42 arrests. How many convictions? Seven convictions. Yeah, seven convictions. And what kind of convictions are they? Now, you got the list right there in front of you. You check it off and see if I'm wrong, right? Seven convictions. Now, of the seven convictions, I got three disorderly conduct charges. In other words, I got licked up and made a lot of noise. Then you got uh, one juvenile delinquency. Uh, that's when I missed school. I was out working. You got one parole violation. I've forgotten what the details on that was. I uh, didn't report. I must have overslept, something like that. You got a petty larceny. That's when I was a kid. We were swiping bananas. And you got the seventh one, and that's the assault. Yeah. The assault. Tell us about that, Mr. Rallis. I'll tell you about the assault. I'll tell you what happened there. We were playing cards in the garage. What was the name of that guy? Battle. Battles. Battles. And I don't know what's the matter with this fellow. I think there was something wrong with him in the head. He was a kind of a creepy guy. Did he speak was up, uh, Mr. Rickett. I say he was losing and I was winning and... Uh, and you he... hit him over the head with no, a bottle, he's... didn't you? Let me finish. He suddenly got excited. He suddenly got excited and he came after me with one of those tire irons. I was sitting there, we were drinking beer and I had to give him a shot with a bottle. Are you claiming self-defense? Self-defense? You give me a rap with that Are you claiming iron. that was self-defense? You bet it was self-defense. The judge who uh, sat on that case had rather a different opinion, didn't he? Well, I don't care what his opinion was. He wasn't his opinion there, I was, was there. that you were guilty of assault, and he gave you three years in jail for it. And what's more, Mr. Ellis, he said on that occasion, and this is a direct quote, sir, Rellis is one of the most vicious characters we have had in years. I am convinced he will eventually either be sentenced to prison for life or be put out of the way by some good detective with a couple of bullets, end quote. Now, that's not the end of the quote, because I'm going to end the quote. What I want to know is this. Where does this guy come off saying things like that? 
He's a judge sitting up on a bench right away, hey, gets the glasses hey, hey, and the kimono. Hey, hey, hey. No, that'll be I'm just doing. about enough of that, All Mr. right, Ellis. all right, I understand what I'm doing. I just want to say this. Here you got a respected judge. This man is being paid by the state, and he's announcing to the world he's going to give somebody a medal for knocking me off. Now, what kind of business is that? What's the matter? I don't have a family. I'm married. I got a kid. Yeah, the kids don't play with him. Go on, take a walk. Your old man's a gorilla. How about that? That's not a violation of my constitutional rights. Let's talk about that. All right, all right. Let's talk about your constitutional rights. When you were 13, you broke into a parked truck and stole $500 worth of merchandise. You were sent to the reformatory for five months. Did you consider this a violation of your constitutional rights? That isn't a constitutional all right. right. I was on. talking about the At 15, judge the you judge. were an experienced extortionist. You were forcing shopkeepers to pay you and your gang protection. If they didn't pay, you broke their windows, ruined their merchandise, and terrorized their customers. You got proof of that? Is there any and proof then, of that? And if you then, got proof, I'll go to jail. Then now. at 17, when a young girl refused your advances, you slammed into her with your motorcycle. I was an accident, and I made good on that. I made good on all the restitution. Dr. Bill How everything. do you make restitution for injuring a person by deliberately running into her with a motorcycle? What did you say, deliberate? Don't say deliberate. You got the list there in front of you. I got a suspended sentence there. It couldn't have been deliberate. I see you got a... I also see that from July 11th, 1930 to January 13, 1934, you were picked up by the police on 19 different occasions. You were charged with crimes ranging from disorderly conduct to felonious assault including unlawful possession of six guns and a shotgun, and then four additional charges of homicide. And on each and every one of those occasions, there was not sufficient evidence. On each and every one of those occasions, I got a suspended sentence or I was discharged. And I want to ask you, you want to know why they picked me up? I'll tell you why they picked me up. Because whenever the cops in Brooklyn need a fall guy, they come to Relis. Whenever they have to make an arrest to get something on a book or for the newspapers, they come to me. Now, I'm not blaming them. They, they're in a bind. I understand that, but it's tough on me. I got a bail bond guy. I carry him around 24 hours a day. <laughs> Two, three times a month, I'm in and out of jail. What I say is this. Get the cops off my back. Get them back on a beat in Brooklyn, and you'll have a lot less crime over there. Now, Mr. Rallis, let's get back to your business career. You say that you're in the restaurant business? That's right. You got any other businesses? Like what? Like loan sharking, gambling, beer running, extortion, slot machines. Oh, those are not. Those are, those are all crimes. They're all illegal. Yes, I, I know imagine. that. You're not in any of these businesses. I'm in no crimes. Well, uh, none of them. None of them. Not at all. No, none. Well, on this point, Mr. McGrath, could we call Mrs. Rose Fiorenti, please? Mr. Clerk, would you call Mrs. Rose Fiorenti? Rose Fiorenti! Rose Fiorenti, please. Mrs. Fiorenti, would you come forward and take the oath, please? Raise your right hand. Some swear the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God. I do. State your full name. Rosa Fiorente. Seated, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Fiorenti. Uh, Mrs. Fiorenti, you own a stationery store. A uh, uh, candy store. Oh, I'm sorry, a candy store at the corner of Livonia and Saratoga Avenues in uh, the section of Brooklyn that's known as Brownsville. Right? Yes, a candy store. I own it. Uh, Mrs. Fiorenti, you have been called before this committee as a result of an investigation which showed that you know Abe Rellis and that you do have information pertaining to his activities. Now, I want to assure you, uh, Mrs. Fiorenti, that you will be fully protected in connection with any testimony you might give to this committee. Now, Mrs. Fiorenti, I want to ask you, do you know that man over there, Mr. Abe Rallis? I know him for ten years, ten years. Him and his hoodlum, they made my candy store into a hangout. I know him. Mrs. Fiorenti, yes. who, who else besides Abe Rellis uses your store as a hangout? You mentioned the crook, and I got it. <laughs> I should put a sign on my door. I got the biggest bum in the world. You want to know who? Yes, please. Uh, Pittsburgh Phil, uh, Happy Mayone, uh, Dash Abondando, Boggy uh, Goldstein, uh, uh, Luigi Capone, uh, and this one here, look. All these men are in your store every day. Well, uh, they sit inside sometimes, and sometimes they stay outside. You know, they want to be sure that no good customer comes in. Now, Mrs. Fiorenti, tell us what goes on there. What kind of business uh, do these men conduct? <laughs> crooked business, that's what, what. What kind of crooked business? Well, the most, it's uh, a loan business. Uh, you know, uh, six for five. Six for five. In other words, 
The borrower pays back $6 for every $5 he borrows on a one-week basis. Yes. Is that right? Yes. That's 1,000%, more than 1,000% interest per year. I think that's called loan sharking. That's right. You're right. That's what they are. Shock. Now, Mrs. Fiorenti. Yes? I would like you to tell this committee, how does Abe Rellis' gang collect the repayment of these loans? Or what happens if a payment is not made promptly? Tell us that. Oh, you mean if they don't pay on time? That's right. Hmm. I'll tell you. They drag a felon back of the store. Two men hold him by the arm. And then they start to beat him up, beat him up. Uh, Rallis or Pittsburgh Phil or uh, Happy Mayone. And they beat him up, beat him up, until the poor fella can't stand up. Well, uh, Mrs. Fiorenti, if you see them brutally attack these men, why don't you, uh, why don't you try to help them? Why don't you call the police? Oh, Mamma Mia, but you don't understand. We don't pay the protection to the police. We pay protection to him. I see. All the storekeepers, they got to pay him every week. Or else, you know what they do? They throw rocks at the window. They throw acid all over the store. Or else, they beat them up. That's how we live in Brownsville. That's how he wants us to live. I tell you the truth, everybody's scared for, for our life, for our children. Well, of course you are, Mrs. Fiorenti. See? Thank you very much. I have no more questions. No more for uh, me, gentlemen. Mr. Mr. All right, Mr. Carroll, you may cross-examine. No questions, Mr. Chairman. What do you mean, no questions? Ask her how much she got no, paid take it to easy, tell these take lies. It easy. Now, wait a minute. Tell her, wait a minute. Ask her what she got paid to come Please. down. Mr. Ellis, are you accusing this committee of paying its witnesses well, to give testimony? she didn't testimony? come down here for I won't permit you to make a statement like that, Mr. Ellis. I got paid. You got paid. No, I didn't got paid. I came here my free will. And remember, when I put my hand on the Bible to say the truth, I did say the truth. And I pray God, I pray God that they gotta burn you on the electric chair for all you've done to the poor people because you're a murderer, a murderer oh, you are. Mrs. Fiorenti, you're out of order. Abe Rellis, the man who has terrified and virtually subjugated a large section of Brooklyn, seems a bit shaken by the obvious sincerity and emotion of Mrs. Fiorenti's testimony. Right now, for the first time in this hearing, he appears a bit bewildered and worried. Mrs. Fiorenti has been excused from the stand. A short recess has been called, and we return you now briefly to our studios. You know, they used to say foundries and mills were the best place to find a young man who wanted to learn football. But this young man has put that idea into reverse. He's a football player who wants to learn the foundry business. This is Dick Nolan defensive backfield star of the mighty New York Giants, as adept at tackling an opponent as he will be when he tackles the foundry business. When it comes to smoking, this future executive says he's learned all he needs to know about cigarettes. His choice? Camels. Nolan says that occasionally he's borrowed other brands, but Camel is the cigarette he buys. He likes Camel's rich flavor, their mildness, the complete satisfaction he gets every time he lights up. Doesn't that sound like the kind of cigarette you should be smoking? Well, if you find yourself smoking more these days, but enjoying it less, change to Camels. The best tobacco makes the best smoke. Have a real cigarette. Have a Camel. Down in the hearing room, the questioning of Abe Rellis, the acknowledged leader of the Brownsville crime ring, continues. In fact, Mr. Rellis, you don't confine your activities to the Brownsville area alone, do you? Well, I mean, I get around. I don't spend my whole life on Pitkin Avenue. You do operate in Ocean Hill in East New York? I have some business connections in those places, yeah. More luncheonettes? Business connections. As a matter of fact, you and your business partners virtually control East New York and Ocean Hill as well as Brownsville, don't you, Mr. Rellis? Well, I said I have some interest there, I thought. And those interests include loan sharking, don't they? Well, if a friend of mine needs help, I'm not going to turn him down. How about uh, slot machines for your friends? They want you and gum, we got it. Gambling? Everybody can get a bet down. You prostitution? Now, that's a dirty business. That's protection? What do you mean by protection? Oh, you mean insurance? Yeah, we got insurance there. A well-diversified operation, is that right? What is this all about? Yeah, I got a nice modern operation. It's never overlooking the opportunity for growth or expansion. What, what, do you, what does that mean? Well, let's go back a few years. You were pretty well set in Brownsville, but you had your eye on the rich East New York Territory, but that belonged to the Shapiro brothers, isn't that right? Shapiro's the only, uh, the only Shapiro's I knew they had a summer camp up in the mountains. Oh, come on, I'm talking about the Shapiro brothers of East New York. 
Oh, oh, them ship pillows. Yes, yeah. three of them. Irving, Meyer, and Willie. Oh, yeah, Irving, Meyer, Willie, yeah. I know them. I know them a little. Just a little? You know, say hello, you wave goodbye. That's well, sir, so the first one you waved goodbye to was Irv. His permanent departure took place in the vestibule of an apartment house on Blake Avenue in Brooklyn. And transportation was supplied by two bullets in the face. Do you remember that? Well, from uh, what I read in the newspapers, what you said is an accurate description of what happened there. Meyer was next. Tell us what happened to Meyer Shapiro. Well, listen, now, let me ask you a question here. I mean, why are we spending so much time on this Shapiro boys? First of all, I had nothing to do with it. Second, whatever they got, they deserved worse. No connection with you? Not the slightest. How about Florence Merkin? She supplies a connection, doesn't she? You went out with her. She was your girl. What does my personal life have to do with this here? Is it true that she was your girl? I knew her. And after Irv Shapiro's murder, his brother Meyer picked her up on the street, forced her into his car, and drove her to the Canarsie Flatlands. There he raped her and beat her viciously, then sent her back to you with a message. What was the message, Rellis? Well, you seem to know a lot about it. Why don't you tell him? Wasn't the message, go tell Rellis what happened, tell him regards for Maya Shapiro, right? That's right. That guy almost killed that girl, and whatever he got, he deserved worse. Tell us what he got, Rellis. He got hit. Was he taken for a ride? Listen, there were a hundred guys out to get that bum. You're not going to pin it on me. Two down, one to go. Willie Shapiro, the last of the clan. He became what is known in your professional circles as a bag job, didn't he? He became an ex-Shapiro, that's right. Mr. Rallis, what's a bag job? Not a public library. You want the information, you go look it up. What is but that would be second-hand information, Mr. Rallis. I like to get my information from an expert. Now, what's a bag job? What's a bag job? It's a job where you use a bag. That's All a bag right. job. All right, give me an example, will you? Santa Claus, he uses a bag. Mr. Leave McGrath. Mr. McGrath, can't we control this witness, please? Now, Mr. Ellis, you're not helping yourself very much. You said you wanted to co cooperate. I insist that you answer these questions directly, minus the wisecracks. Well, I don't care what you insist. You're not going to tie me in with the Shapiro thing. They were rotten inside. They didn't have a friend tight. They wouldn't part with a dollar. Irv, the little one, he don't pay a quarter to see an earthquake miserable. You wouldn't believe it. They got knocked off. And whoever did it should have been elected the mayor. That's all. You haven't told us yet what a bag job is. Oh, this guy is still on a bag job. What do you think That's of that? That's right. All right, the bag job is when you put a body in a bag. Now, you're satisfied? And I'm satisfied. That's what's happened to the last surviving Sapiro. He got stuffed in a bag, and his body was dumped in the sand dunes of Flushing Bay. Wasn't that right? That's right. And if I was the seagulls out there, I'd be raising hell. I'll tell you that. So with the Shapiros out of the way, you had East New York in your pocket. Tell us how you took Ocean Hill, Mr. Rullis. Well, they got them Indians out in Canarsie. I bought it from the Canarsie Indians. It's, uh... You don't have to be so modest, Mr. Rullis, about your Ocean Hill takeover. That was a straight business deal. It was nice and clean like the rest of your life. You merged your operation with Happy Mayone's operation, and he owned Ocean Hill. Isn't that right? Mr. Rellis? I got something to say here. I'd like to say something. All right, you may make a statement. I said when I came in that I was going to cooperate, that I wanted to help you. That's right. Now, you guys haven't asked me a legitimate question since I sat down here. You give me straight questions, and I'm going to give you straight answers. But don't ask me what you're guessing that I know. Ask me what I know. All right. Then maybe we can get something done here. All right. That's enough of the lecture, Mr. Ellis. We'll play it your way, then. Will you tell us, please, what you know about the late Red Alpert? You got nothing to tie me in with Red Alpert. The question was, what do you know about the late Red Alpert? Nothing. You don't know that he was murdered at the age of 19? I don't know nothing. Oh, you don't? It was in the newspapers, don't you recall that? No, I don't read newspapers. Well, perhaps it will refresh your memory if I tell you that he was found dead at the edge of a yard on November 25th, 1933. Well, you know, I can't remember the names of everybody who got shot in Brooklyn and the dates. What? Did you say shot? I didn't say he was shot, Mr. Ellis. I said he was murdered. Well, I don't, I don't care what you said. I mean, what difference does it make? Whatever he was. You can't tie me in with Red Albert. That's all I'm saying now. Stop guessing about these things and oh, let's get on. You, you think we're guessing, do you? You're guessing. Oh, You're not well. even guessing. We'll Look, see about that. Part. Just a moment now. Mr. Clerk, will you please call Harry Rudolph? Harry Rudolph? What, are they kidding? Oh, you won't believe me. Quiet this now, Mr. Rudolph. Quiet, please. I mean, this guy has to go. Come in and be sworn, Mr. Rudolph. Mr. Clerk. Right hand. The song is for the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth shall be done. I do. State your full name. Rudolph. Your full name. Harry, Harry Rudolph. Be seated, please. Mr. Chairman, I'm in possession of information which seems to indicate that Mr. Rudolph is mentally incompetent. 
therefore should not be permitted to testify. I would suggest before this committee here may be referred to a psychiatrist for examination. Now, Mr. Carroll, the committee understands that such an examination has been made and the alienist has certified that Mr. Rudolph is competent to testify. Therefore, I will overrule your objection. But, Mr. Chair... I've overruled your objection. That's the end of the matter. Exception. Let it be noted. Yeah, let it also be noted. He's a drunk. He sleeps in hallways. Oh, so right. Get him out of here, Mr. Rudolph. Wait you till you ask your question, it? please. I'll tell you who did it. The Brownsville guys. Him, Rellis. Bugsy Goldstein. Oh, on, you're a nut. You're a nut. I'm Go not, back I'm to not. the welfare. You had him and you hit me, too. You want to see? I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you. Look. Look. That's what they did to me. They stood right next to me. They let me have it. Mr. Chairman, 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 will you put the witness back in the chair? Mr. Chairman. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Carroll. I've overruled your objection. It's not necessary to repeat it. Now, be quiet, Mr. Ellis. Mr. Rudolph. You will remain seated in that chair and you will answer questions that are put to you. You understand what I'm saying to you, sir? Yes. Okay, Your Honor. Mr. Chairman. I haven't even started to sing yet. Now, wait a minute. Don't you understand? This guy has to go away every six months. You're a nut, right? You have to get your head fixed. That's all. That's all. I'm not going to listen to this. Oh, wait. This no, is no, ridiculous. Wait a minute, Dick. Don't you understand? Bailiff. Here's a man that won't let the pool Bailiff, Bailiff. Mr. Sir, bring him in sir, as a If you please, all sir. Right. Sir. All right. You make a circus out of it. Now, Mr. Rudolph, your attention, please. Was Red Alfred a friend of yours, sir? He was my little pal. What was his business? Oh, he was a heister. A heister? A second story work. You mean he was a burglar? He was very expert at his work. Well, will you tell this committee what his connection was with Abe Rellis? Well, on one job, Red brings back a very nice haul of jewels. Worth an easy ten grand. He figures to fence him through Rellis and Pittsburgh Phil. So he goes over to Midnight Rose's place and he shows the ice to Phil. He asks three G's. But that cheapskate Phil, he says he'd pay 700. I'll put laughs in his face. Later, Phil gets hungry for the ice, so he sends Rellis and Bugsy Goldstein up to Alpert's place. I am in with Red when these two bums break in. I don't even know what's happening. Bam, bam, bam. I'll show you what they did to me. No, no. Let me show no, you what sit they down, did. Mr. Rudolph. Mr. Chairman, Just the stand is obvious. The ungodness's testimony can't be believed. All, all right, Mr. Carroll. All right, I'll take care of this. Mr. Rudolph, Mr. Rudolph if you please. Come on. Now, you gentlemen, have any further questions? No questions. Man. No questions. You all right, Mr. Rudolph? Very well, you may cross-examine, Mr. Carroll. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now, Mr. Rudolph, when you entered this hearing room, you were in custody. Are you presently in prison? Yes. But I'm safer in prison than Abe Rellis is out here. In other words, you're a convicted criminal. How many times have you been arrested, Mr. Rudolph? Fifteen. Convicted twice. Don't worry about my record. I'm sitting comfortable where I am. The pressure's on the old boy, Rellis. Mr. Chairman, this man's a convicted criminal. I move that his entire testimony be stricken. Denied. I got answers to questions I ain't even been asked yet. Look, you guys brought me down here to put the finger on Rellis, That's right? just what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. For a quarter, this guy comes running down here to say anything. The man is garbage. Can't you understand that? He shouldn't be allowed in the room. Get him out of here. Quiet, Mr. Rellis. Ed, you're on the list. You're on the big guy's list, Abe. Yeah, Abe. He's called on you, Abe. What? It's all over, Abe. Ziggy's talking and Ali's talking. And they know the big guy's bumping you off. That's why. That's why they're all talking. You're through, Rallis. You're finished. No more questions, Mr. Chairman. Well, the committee has some additional wait, questions to put to this wait, witness. Wait, now, Mr. Rudolph, did I understand you to say wait, wait, in the car with the dead wait, body of Rudolph? I'll give you a... Get away from me. I'll give you a rap. Listen, I'm going to I'm gonna give you the whole smear. I want to talk. I want to talk. I give you anything. Completely unexpected, a sudden complete turnabout by Rellis, the cynical Brownsville gangster, quite obviously shocked by the news that members of his gang are revealing what they know to the authorities, and that quite possibly he may be marked for death by some unknown gang czar. Rellis himself is suddenly demanding a deal so that he can spread on the record the truth about the wave of murders that shocked the people of Brooklyn and the nation during the past few years. Chairman McGrath has granted Mr. Carroll's immediate request for a recess. We return you now briefly to our studios. Here's something worth paying for. 
King's Men, such expensive-looking gifts for good grooming that are not expensive at all. King's Men toiletries are fun to give, fun to get. Perfect for Uncle Mike. Great for Grandpa. Brother Bill's favorite toiletries. And, of course, Dad gets the very finest King's Men set with a very special greeting. King's Men gifts for good grooming, priced from just $1 to $11. Offer each would-be Santa Claus a wonderful variety of gift sets. And individual items, each one beautifully gift packaged and crowned with a golden knight's head. King's Men, gifts for good grooming, from $1 to $11. Down in the hearing room, the probe into the criminal career of Abe Rellis is still in recess. As I mentioned earlier, Rellis and his advisor had a special meeting with Chairman McGrath. Now, I understand, and it's quite obvious, that uh, Rellis has requested additional witnesses to be present here in the hearing chamber. And uh, once again, another hint that we can expect sensational developments in the remainder of this session. This hearing uh, should be getting underway very shortly, but until then, we return you to our studios. This portion of The Witness was brought to you by Camel, the real cigarette. The best tobacco makes the best smoke. Speaking for Camel was James Daly. Down in the hearing room, Abe Rellis and his advisor, Mr. J. Richard Carroll, have re-entered the hearing chamber. The members of the committee are already in their seats, and this hearing is about to resume. Yeah, yes, sir, Mr. Carroll. Mr. Chairman, I've done my best during this past recess to persuade Mr. Rellis that what he's about to do is not to his best interests. I told him that while I'm in complete agreement that he should reveal all that he knows about crime and racketeering in Brooklyn, he should not do so in a public hearing and without proper legal safeguards. He's an absolute determination to disregard my advice. All right, hey, listen, get it over with you. Talked enough. I ask your permission to withdraw, Mr. Chairman. Now, Mr. Rellis, I suggest you think this over very carefully before you make this decision. I know what I'm doing. You're absolutely sure you want to go on without legal counsel? That's right. Very well. Permission granted. You Thank you, leave, sir. Mr. Carroll. Hey, where are you going? Leave the notes here, will you? All Make right, Mr. Ellis. All right. You, uh, you may proceed then, sir. You're ready to proceed. All right. And what I got to say, we can proceed a long way. Because what I can tell you about crime could blow the lid off this whole country. In other words, I could give you names. I can give you names of politicians. I could give you names of racketeers. The labor leaders, I could give you stuff would turn this whole country inside out, and you better believe me. But I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to give you a taste. In other words, this is going to be like the common attractions in the movies. I'm going to get you good and interesting. But if you want to see the whole picture, you're going to have to buy the ticket from the DA. Because he's the guy that I'm going to make the deal with, and I'm going to make a good deal. Because what I got, he's crying for. Now, you ready? Yes, we're quite ready, Mr. Ellis. All right. Get me some water, will you? And bring these gentlemen some water, too. All right. All right, Bailey, if you can get some water. Now, you had to make me laugh before because you kept asking me about Bronzeville. Everything had to do with Bronzeville. What were the murders in Bronzeville? What's my operation in Bronzeville? Forget Bronzeville. Bronzeville is nothing. Bronzeville is just a drop in a bucket. Well, are you telling us you're in a position to tell us about crime outside the borough of Brooklyn? I'm in a position to make your hair stand on it. Now, just take it for instance. You asked me about 200 murders. Well, suppose we talk about a thousand murders. Let's talk about murders in Denver, in Los Angeles, in Philadelphia, in uh, Cleveland, now Just hold in Chicago. Just hold it for a minute, Mr. Rellis. A thousand murders? You can't be serious. Listen, I'm going back ten years. You mean to tell me the combination can't make a hundred hits a year? You're crazy. Combination? What combination are you talking about? There's only one combination. That's the one that operates from New York to California. I'm talking about boys that got a lock on everything from one coast to the other. I'm talking about the biggest. That's what I'm talking about. All right. Listen, you want to start right from the beginning? Yes, I think that's an excellent idea. All right, we start from the beginning. Now, you guys asked me about my tie-in with Happy Meone and Ocean Hill, right? Well, you were right, but you didn't go far enough. This is what you didn't know. Meone has a guy named Louis Capone working for him. Now, this guy Capone represents... I'm going to save that. I'm not going to tell you that. That's for the DA. At any rate, he represents this Mr. X. And it's his job to see to it that this X gets a proper share of Mayoni's business, right? Now, when I tie in with Mayoni through Capone, I get to meet Mr. X. Well, one thing leads to another. You know, we get friendly. He likes me. I like him. And before you know it, um, uh, 
I'm doing little odd jobs for him. What I'm... kind of odd jobs? Well, little stuff. We were started out, we were just doing some shamans for him. Beating people up. That's right. We're very good at that. Well, now, now who is we? Uh, who are we talking well, about? When now? I say we, I'm talking about Pittsburgh, Phil. And I'm talking about Bugsy Goldstein and the rest of the guys, the smaller guys. And uh, when we joined up with Ocean Hill, I'm talking about Happy Mayoni and Louis Capone. That's the organization. I see. All right. Now, after we got done doing these little jobs, after a while, we graduated to bigger things. So when a big guy needed somebody hit... Hit? You mean murder? That's right. When he wanted somebody hit, we did the hitting for him. And I think the first one that we did was a guy called John Pollock. In other words, the big guy ordered him hit, and we hit him. And the big guy did that for a favor for, uh... That was for Willie Moretti out in Jersey. All right, now, wait a minute. Let me get all this straight. First, who is John the Pollock? I didn't know who he was. I mean, you murdered him? You don't even know who he is? Well, what has that got to do with it? We were doing a job. That has nothing to do with it. But you didn't even know the man. What do you mean, didn't know him? Well, we had somebody finger him. I mean, we knew who he was as far as that was concerned. How many odd jobs like this did you do? Well, we did quite a few there in the beginning, but we got busier later on is when we got mostly busy. And when you hit somebody, were you paid for your work? Well, we didn't do it for charity. Of course we got it. We got expenses. We got expenses, and we got a certain sum. But the most important thing that we got there was... Uh, if we did a good hit, you see, then it would give us a little extra territory. Like we might get the slot machines in Sheepshead Bay. We might get them in Canarsie. You mean he deals out this territory as though he owns it? What do you mean, as though he owns it? You don't sneeze in Brooklyn, but what this big guy knows it. And that goes for everything. He's got uh, numbers there. He's got the gambling there. He's got girls there. He's got the whole thing. You name it, he's got it. And this relationship with the Rackets boss of Brooklyn was just the beginning? Is that what you're saying? That's right. That was just the beginning. What happened was this. One day, this big guy, he says to me, says, kid, I want you to meet Lepke. He's anxious to meet you. Well, right away, if I'm going to meet Lepke, that's good. So I go over to New York. I go to Lepke's office. Now, Lepke's got an office. He's got on Fifth Avenue. He's got wall-to-wall -wall carpet in there. He's got indirect... Oh, wait a minute. Hold, hold, hold it a minute. Hold it just a minute, office. Mr. Ellis. When you say Lepke, for the record, you mean Louis Buckhalter? For the record, I mean the guy that runs the garment in. That's what I mean. All right, so I have this meeting with Lepke. Well, he's telling me he likes my operation and he likes me and I say thank you and so on and so forth. And finally he says to me, Abe, I want you to work for me. I want you to work exclusive for the combination. Well, right away, I know that this is a big What thing. position so, does Lepke occupy in the combination? Well, he's like the, uh, he's like the chairman of the board. No, we, we used to call him the judge. That's because uh, he's very intelligent. And he wanted you to work for the combination. That's right. He wanted me on an exclusive basis. What does that mean? Well, that means that uh, we couldn't hit on our own. In other words, we only could hit for him on his orders. Let me give you an example there of what happened. Say, uh, Charlie Fischetti out in Chicago, or Benaggio in Kansas City. Say they want somebody here, right? Well, they send word to Lepke. Then Lepke tells his man, that's Mandy Weiss. And then Mendy Weiss, he issues a contract. A uh, contract, that's an order for a killing? That's right, that's an order for a killing. And that could be anywhere. We could go to Denver, we could go to Chicago. We went as far as Los Angeles, go to Pennsylvania, any place. It could be either me or Pittsburgh, Phil, sometimes the two of us together, whatever it was. Put the equipment in a bag and we go. Equipment? Yeah. In other words, we had a black bag and we put the stuff in you there. You mean we the guns? Well, guns or rope or whatever it is, whatever we needed. Mr. Ellis, how often did you travel under these arrangements? Well, whenever we got a contract. Will you tell the committee how you were paid for this service? Well, we got paid pretty good. There was no piece work involved. This was on a yearly basis. We got $12,000 a year. And that money was delivered to us on the first of every month. That was by Lepke's man. Mr. Ellis, I must say this to you. It's absolutely incredible to me to see a, a, a human being sit so calmly and relate so coolly, so cold-blooded an account of murder for pay. Wait a minute. Just wait a minute. You talk like we were knocking off innocent people. What do you think? We just went around shooting people? Any bum that we hit, he deserved to be hit. Otherwise, there wouldn't have been no contract on it. In other words, he was trying to muscle in, trying to grab a little something for himself, whatever it was. Otherwise, there would have been no contract. And another thing, it was a good thing we hit him. Because if we didn't do it, somebody else would. You're liable to get some slap happy kid, and before you know it, uh, some innocent bystander gets hurt. And that never happened when you handled the no, job? Sir, not with us, because we laid the whole thing out. We were like engineers. And you never made a mistake? No, we didn't make no mistakes. If we did, it was an accident. 
Well, did you ever have an accident? No, we never had no... Wait a minute. Yeah, one time what happened was that the... The finger man, he, uh, he pointed out the wrong guy, and the wrong guy got hit. That was, uh... That was no good, but those things happen. Listen, you could walk out here right now, a piano could fall on your head. You know, that's why you have insurance. Mr. Ellis, let me ask you this. In your career of crime, did you once, did you ever once think of your victim? What do you think we were dealing with? We were dealing with little chiselers here that were trying to get a little something extra. No, I never thought of the victim. I didn't even know their name. Among the things that baffle me, Mr. Ellis, is how you were able to commit murder and not have any emotional response to it. What is that? Well, didn't your conscience ever bother you? You were killing human beings. Didn't you think about it or worry about it? Now, wait a minute. Just, just wait one minute. Now, you're a lawyer, right? You go into court, you try a case. Now, the first time you did it, you were a little nervous, weren't you? But the second time, you weren't so nervous. The third time, the fourth time, it got easier and easier. Before you know it, you didn't even think about it, right? Mr. Ellis, I must say, this has been quite an amazing story you're telling us. However, you have been very careful not to implicate yourself in any of these murders. You've been talking in vague generalities. Now, you, you have said that you can expose a thousand murders, and apparently you hope to uh, make some kind of arrangement with the district attorney. Now, uh, this taste that you have promised us has been a little tasteless, to, uh, in my opinion. Why don't you give us some facts? You want facts? Names, dates, places. You want names, you want places. And details. And details. You want all that, huh? All right. Well, I'm going to give them to you. I want to call a witness. That's your now. privilege, Mr. Ellis. I want to call my partner from Ocean Hill. I want Harry Mione in here. Harry Mione? Clerk, will you call Harry Mione, please? Harry Mione? Harry Mione? Abe Rellis, Kid Twist, has called to the stand his erstwhile partner in murder, Happy Myoni, promising to reveal names, places, and dates of the incredible succession of killings his ring of hoodlums is responsible for. A short recess has been called here in the hearing room. We return you now to our studios. The open road, stretching anywhere. A highway to exciting new places where every week two young travelers find adventure on Route 66. Here is the bold new dramatic series starring Martin Milner and George Maharis as two eager young adventurers traveling the open road in search of action, life, and fortune. At every crossroad and beyond every hill and curve waits a new thrill, a new challenge, a new danger. Sometimes they're lucky. Other times they have to fight for their lives. Sometimes peril is the price for wandering to the wrong places. But whatever the road ahead holds, one thing Todd and Buzz always find is excitement, and you will too, when you join them on Route 66 every Friday night on most of these stations. Down in the hearing room, Harry Happy Myoni is about to be sworn in, and our probe into the National Kill for Hire organization of Abrellis continues. Bible, raise your right hand. Oh, that wait a minute. No, I want to know what's going on around You, you must be sworn first. I don't like to know what's going on. After all, you hustle me down here in a meat wagon, and here I am. Your rights will not be violated. You'll have ample time to make a statement. Proceed with the oath, Mr. Clerk. You solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? About what? Go ahead, Harry. Huh? Go ahead, it's all right. I do. State your full name. My own. Your full name, please. Harry, my own. Thank you. Be seated, please. Now, Mr. Myoni, Mr. Rellis has some questions to put to you. All right, Mr. Rellis, you may proceed. How you been, Hap? How did you treat me? Oh, they don't let me get no exercise. Hey, what's going on here? I don't get it. Well, you'll get it. Uh, just take it easy. Uh, you see these gentlemen here from the committee, uh, they want some information, and uh, we got to help them. What are you talking about? I'm talking about Rudnick. Who? Whitey Rudnick. I don't seem to remember the name, Abe. You don't remember Whitey Rudnick? What are you doing, Abe? I'm talking about Rudnick. That's what I'm doing. I'm talking about that time when we were standing on the corner. We first got word that we had to take Rudnick. I'm getting out of here. Hey, I don't know no Rudnick. I don't know no Rudnick. Come on, Harry. Come on. You know I'm better than I do. 
This guy, Rudnick, he was kind of a small-time guy. We had some slot machines over there in Jersey. So he started to get a little shaky. We thought he was going to talk. So Mendy Weiss, he gave the word to Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh Phil. Phil comes over the corner. He meets me and Harry. And he says, we got to take Rudnick. Do you remember that? I don't remember nothing. I was never there. You weren't there. You weren't there when I told Harry to go clip a car? No, I don't know what you're talking about. You don't know what I'm talking about. You don't remember when Ali went over to Bay Ridge, he come back with the car, we got in the car, we started looking for Rudnick? Why don't you keep your fat mouth shut? Because I gotta watch out for myself, Harry, that's why. That's why. So we started looking for this guy, Rudnick. It was late, it was at night, we were driving around, cruising around, we are trying to find him. Well, we finally find him, we get him in a car. Philly slugs him, and we take him over to Kaiser Bill's garage. Now, do you remember that? I don't remember nothing, I wasn't there. What do you mean you weren't there? You're the guy with the meat cleaver, and Philly had an ice pick. This guy's off his rocker. My grandma was dying, I never left the side. Come on, Harry, come on. Tell him about the trouble we had. Why don't you shut up? Car. Go on, tell him. What happened was that after we got done in the garage, you see, we tried to get this guy running in the car, but we had trouble. So Harry and Phil, they fold him up, and they're getting him in the car. And as they're doing that, Harry says, I want to give this bum another shot for luck. Don't listen to him. He's trying to frame me. I'm trying to frame you. I'm only telling the truth. Shut up. Well, you don't want to talk about the running job? All right, we'll talk about something else. We'll talk about the Steve Myers hit. You don't want to talk about that? We'll talk about the Cooperman. Don't listen to him. You don't want that? How about Augie Justiano? Where did you get him? You got him right around the corner from Rudnick. I got more. How about his Get the Get him out of here. Get him out of here. Get him out of here. Order. Order. Mr. Ellis, are you all right? Please be seated, sir. Bailiff, will you close those doors? You all right, Mr. Ellis? Yeah, I'm fine. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to uh, pin down some of this testimony, if I may. Very well, Mr. Smithers, go ahead. Now, Mr. Ellis? Mr. Ellis? Yeah. Myoni and Pittsburgh Phil killed Whitey Rudnick, is that right? That's right, just exactly the way I told you. It was in Kaiser's Bill Garage, and it was on May 25th, that was in 1937. It was, uh, as a matter of fact, it was, it was about 2.15 at night. You know the time because you were there? That's right, I was there. So that, in fact, you are as guilty of this murder as they are? I didn't kill Rudnick. But you were there. I was a spectator. So you were an accomplice. That's right. That's right. I was an accomplice. I was an accomplice of Harry and Phil's. And Harry and Phil, they were an accomplice of me. And that makes a very interesting situation. Because no matter what I say about Harry and Phil, no matter what they say about me, nobody can touch us on that. The law says that you can't convict on the uncooperated testimony of an accomplice. And you know what that means? That means nobody can touch anybody until they get what I got. And what is it that you've got? I got the cooperation. That's what I got. Corroborating testimony from witnesses not connected with these murders? That's right. Well, name those witnesses for us. Name the witnesses? Yes. What, are you kidding? I'm not naming anybody. I give that to the DA. That's how I get my immunity. That's how I get my deal. Now, now, Mr. Ellis, you do understand that whether or not the district attorney's office decides to grant you immunity for state's evidence is beyond the concern of this committee. You do oh, understand that? I understand that, of course. That's obvious. What you want is, uh, you want facts, right? That's right. We want all the facts, and we're determined to get them. All right. Okay, and I'm going to give them to you. I want to call in a witness now. All right, that's your privilege. Now, let me tell you something about this guy. This guy had the reputation of being the biggest hitter in the country. In other words, if you wanted the best, you called this guy. This guy never bungled the job. As a matter of fact, he liked to do it. This guy's name is Pittsburgh Phil. I want to call him in here now. Call Harry Strauss in here. Mr. Clerk, call Harry Strauss. Harry Strauss? Harry Strauss? Hi, kid. What do you say, Pep? How are you? Oh, no, no. Proceed with the oath, please. Thank you, right hand. Would you like to the Bible? You solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Second. State your full name. Harry Strauss. You are also known as Pittsburgh Phil? Yeah, right. Excuse me. All right, you may question the witness, uh, Mr. Ellis. Have you know what's going on here? No, tell me. This is a hearing here. I don't hear nothing. <laughs> but you're not supposed to hear anything. You know what you're supposed to do? You're supposed to talk. Oh, 
Okay, let's talk. What do we talk about? Let's talk about Feinstein. Who? Fuggy Feinstein. Why? Because you know more about him than anybody. Wait That's a why. minute. All what? right, wait a minute. That's a good idea because I, I, I'm going to explain this. This all happened on September 1st, 1939. I was standing on a corner. Pepe came up to me. He says, we got to take a guy named Fuggy Feinstein. He's a guy from Burrow Hall. So we conned him to come up to my house. We said, uh, you want to play some cards? He says, okay. And he comes up the house. Pep, you remember all this? No. You don't remember, huh? You don't remember when we took him in the living room? You and I went out in the foyer. We started talking how we're going to make the hit. You said to me, do you have a rope and a nice pick? I couldn't find a rope. I went downstairs in the cellar and I found that old wash line down there. Come on, Pep, you remember that. What, are you losing them or something? Come on, Pep. Huh. It was your hit. You want to tell them about it? Go ahead. It was your hit, Pep. Come on, I'm giving you a chance now. It was your hit. Go ahead, tell them. You don't want to tell them, I'll tell them. We come back from the outside. I start talking to this guy. He's facing me. Philly here, he comes in back of him. He put one arm around his neck, and with the other arm, he started giving it to him with the pig. He's crazy. No, I'm not crazy. I'm not crazy. Puggy went down. Peppy here took a rope, he tied it around him. I went running quick to the kitchen. I took out the newspapers. We don't mess up the room. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You wish to make I a statement, got sir? Something to well, say. it's about time. What I want to tell you, gentlemen, is that I got an ulcer. I'm on a special diet. In that lousy jail I'm in, they won't give me no milk. I'm supposed to have five glasses a day. That's doctor's orders. Now, that you can't tell you. Mr. Strauss, Now, wait a minute. Just a minute. It's all right. They asked me to come up here and tell my story. I've seen three doctors. You don't know how much pain I got from my house. Did you or did you not kill Puggy Feinstein? Answer the question. Yeah. Does that mean yes? What? Now, look here. Stop trying to insult the intelligence of this committee. Answer the question, yes or no. Did you kill the man or did you not? Tell you. Fine. First time it happened, maybe two years ago. The first time for what? The pain. It doubled me up. I didn't know what happened. Oh. It. it was like hot steel in my belly. It's like somebody took a handful of my right, guts Mr. and they started Strauss. to twist. Now look, Mr. Strauss, to... I'm going to insist. Twist? I thought I would die. I yelled out loud. I couldn't stand it. It was like fire every place. Fire really? all Mr. over my belly. Just, every place. just take him out of here. Kept going. Order, order. Get him out of here. That's some act he's got there. All right, Mr. That Rose. act is going to get him into the chair Mr. and Rose. him. What the members of this committee want to know is this. Can you produce any corroborating evidence with respect to the murders you've been telling us about? You're damn right I can. Well, will you give that to us now? No, I'm not going to give it to you now. I'm not going to give you anything about that now. That I give to the DA. That's my protection. That's how I get my immunity. That's where I get my deal. All right, Mr. Chairman, can we refer all of this testimony to the office of the district attorney Mr. for appropriate action? Certainly. Will you see that the minutes are sealed and sent to the district attorney's office, Mr. Clerk? And believe me when I tell you this. What I got goes a lot higher than Harry and Phil. What I got could put a bomb under the biggest people in this country. That's what I got. And that's why I don't have anything to worry about. Now, let's just see what the DA's got. Let's see how good he goes. Because if he goes good enough... Then you read tomorrow's papers. I got the headlines right here. Mr. Ellis, this committee will not be involved in the very difficult decision which the district attorney must make as to whether to grant you some form of immunity in return for giving testimony for the prosecution. However, I will say this, and say it very emphatically, that the story that you have told us here tonight defies our belief or understanding. And yet, paradoxically, Mr. Ellis, we have no doubt that most of it is true. You have given us a glimpse into a subhuman world, a world inhabited by animals like yourself and dominated by a criminal element, an element which must be rooted out and stamped out if our communities are to be made safe for decent people. This hearing is adjourned. 
Averellis Kid Twist did turn state's evidence. On the basis of the information he revealed, six of the leaders of the Murder Incorporated ring, including the infamous Lepke, were sent to the chair. For over 20 months, Rellis remained in custody of the Brooklyn authorities with a round-the-clock guard of a squad of uniformed policemen and detectives. But on the night of March the 11th, 1941, with his song of murder still unfinished, with promises of big names still to come, Abe Rellis, Kid Twist, fell or jumped to his death from the sixth story of this Coney Island hotel. Our witness tonight was Abe Rellis. Next week, the witness will be notorious gang lord Dutch Schultz. Dutch Schultz, who went as far in his ruthless career as to actually plot the murder of New York District Attorney Thomas E. Dewey. So the Dutchman says, Dewey's got to go. And the big guy said, no go, no dice. So the Dutchman said, nuts to you, I'll take care of Dewey on my own. So like I said, they had a meet yesterday, and they decided, well, if it's between the Dewey or the Dutchman... The Dutchman's got to go. The whole Dewey caper's all yours, Dutch. But I warn you, if you try it, it's going to kill you. Lepke said so. I don't care what Lepke says. I'm not taking orders from him or any of those bums. Lepke, Luciano, or any of those guys. I don't need anybody. I don't need them. I don't need you. How many mouthpieces like you I can get with peanuts? And you guys sitting up there. You rigged this to break me. You tried to scare me. Well, you missed a mile. Because I'm still the same guy I was when I walked in here. Boss of my own operation. The only boss. And this is a message I got for anybody interested. Don't get in a Dutchman's way. Sit down, Mr. Schultz. Bailiff. Sit down, sir. This is Charles Collingwood inviting you to meet two fascinating and accomplished hosts, person to person, next on most of these stations. St. Paul's Cathedral Boys Choir of London will sing for you in the special holiday program, Christmas Star Time, featuring Leonard Bernstein and the New York Philharmonic, Marian Anderson, and the Schola Cantorum. Join in this award-winning musical celebration of Christmas Star Time on most of these stations. The preceding program was pre-recorded.